we've all had days where we, man, I wish I could start all over. Listen, we can't start this day over, uh, but you can get up, you can walk out of here with a fresh attitude, fresh spirit, get up in the morning, make up your mind that you're going to do what's right, you're going to make it a good day. Uh, a good friend of mine, you'll, you'll get to meet him this weekend, Pastor Lipsy, that's his favorite. Uh, my pa former pastor, Monsahatchee, that's his deal, make it a good day. Make it a good day. You do what you can to make it a great day. Because sometimes we do everything we can to make it a bad day. Uh, we'll blame everybody else, but it's our fault. But make it a great day. Make it a great week. Make up your mind. You're going to do what's right, and you're going to pursue that. Uh, we're going to be kind of just going along that theme tonight. I, I can't get off. Um, you know, we've been talking about the last month about battling up here, just the war that rages in our mind and the and the thoughts that come in and our responsibility that we battle not against flesh and blood and, and our weapons of warfare are not carnal but they're mighty pulling home pulling down strongholds and and that wrote the word stronghold literally means a castle a fortress something that is solid and big and so god's given us the ability to tear those things and blow them apart and and, and through his word and through his peace, we have that ability. So we're just going to kind of go a little deeper tonight on that. And we'll share some things that God's been speaking in my heart this week. But before we move on, I want to ask our ushers to come tonight. If you've come prepared to give, uh, I just want to give you an opportunity to do that tonight. Uh, Brother, do we have, Brother Ralph, will you help me out tonight? Rose here. If you've come prepared to give tonight, we just want to give you an opportunity to do that. If God has blessed you, you've heard me say it over and over again. I'd rather be in a place where I'm able to give than to be in a place where I need to receive. Uh, that, that, what that means, is, I mean, more blessed to give than it is to receive. That's what that scripture means. I'd rather be in a place where I'm able to give than to be in a place where I need to receive. And we've had that times in our life where we didn't have anything to give. We needed to receive. Uh, but if God has blessed you tonight, and if, you, if you're faithful and you honor him and you're obedient, Obedience opens up the promises of God. Somebody say amen. amen. Everything in scripture, everything in here, it's, it, it all starts with our obedience, period. It starts with our obedience. It doesn't matter if grandma's saved and grandpa's saved and mom's saved and all the aunts and uncles cousins until you and I are obedient and confessing with our mouth and obedient and following his commands and doing what's right. We will not experience the blessings of God. But when you're obedient in all the areas of your life, it opens up, it gives God the opportunity to bless you. And honoring God with your finances, honoring God with the first 10% of everything that he blesses you with, it's not a money issue, okay? We make it about a money issue because our life revolves around money. Everybody say amen. amen. Well, we see it as money. It's money. I, I need, that's money. I need that, Pastor. It is a money issue. Me giving you the church my money is a money issue. It's money. It, it's God's, in God's eyes, it's not a money issue. In God's eyes, it's an opportunity for him to bless you. Because every time you're obedient in what he promises, when you're obedient, it gives him an opportunity to bless you. And so when you're obedient in your finances, he can bless you in your finances. When you're obedient in your spiritual walk and in your relationship, he can bless your marriage and he can bless you. It's an opportunity. We're not robbing him so much of his money. He don't need our money. Everybody say amen. amen. We're robbing him of a chance to bless you and I. And it's not it's more than just financial blessings. It's blessings on your life that go above and beyond what we can even experience. So I want to encourage you tonight. Be faithful in your giving. Be faithful in your giving and God will bless you. Not because I said it, because his word says it. It's the only word in scripture that he says, test me. Only where? Only place in all this Bible that his word says, test me in this. And it has to do with paying your tithes. Now, if God would challenge you and I, don't you think you would fulfill that? There, there's, there's something to that. I can testify to it. I've been faithful paying my tithes when I, had, when I was making good money and when I was making no money at all. And I'd much rather write out a big tie check than a little tie check. All right? I've written out tie checks of $10 and $5 and $25 and $75. I like those big tie checks. Wouldn't you love to be able to write a tie check that's 10% of what God has blessed you? Wouldn't you like to write out like a $5,000 tie check? Ooh, some of you starting to feel it now. Ooh, I'd love to do it. Ooh. It's just, it's God blesses you. If, if, 
If you will honor him and be obedient, God will open the windows of, windows of heaven and bless your life. Amen? Amen? Heavenly Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for this opportunity to give. God, I thank you for the lives that are being changed through the ministries uh, in this fellowship. God, I pray that you'll bless this offering tonight. Use it to further the kingdom of God, Lord. We ask this blessing in your holy name. Amen. Amen. God bless you tonight as you give. quickly tonight, turn to James chapter 1. I just want to challenge you for about 15 minutes tonight. James chapter 1. If you haven't had a chance to read the book of James, you need to make it a point to do that this week. All right? You can read that. It's five chapters. You need to read the book of James. Memorize it if you can. There is a lot of good stuff in the book of James that deals with your personal walk with God. Our women did a Bible study on it. Uh, spent 12 weeks, 8 weeks, 8 weeks on study of James. And uh, it deals with a lot of stuff. It deals with a lot of stuff that us personally that we go through. Uh, we have to deal with taming the tongue and watching what we say. And being you know, quick to listen, slow to anger, all that good stuff that we're not good at. So uh, it, it's just good. It's good to read it. It's good to, to write it down. It's good to highlight it in your Bible so that you can find it when you come back. So you know that it's in James, but you don't know what chapter, but you know you marked it on the right side of the top page, and so you can find it there. And so mark it in your Bible. Read the book of James this week. It will help you and bless you and, and encourage you in, in, in any step of your life. But James chapter 1, we've been talking... Uh, the, really the last month, really just been walking through the scriptures and dealing with uh, the battleground that the, the devil chooses to fight us on. And the battleground he chooses to fight us on is right between our ears. Is in our mind. Our mind is where he chooses to fight us. It's where he chooses most of the things that you deal with tonight, that I deal with tonight, no one ever knows about. We don't, we don't tell people about it. We don't walk around talking what's going on in here, but we sit in conversations and we, we eat lunch with people and we're at work and we're around. And up here, we're being tormented the whole time. Up here, things are going on. There's a battle going on that when you're at work and the boss walks in and he didn't say hi to you that day. And all of a sudden, well, I'm probably the next one getting fired. I heard they're making cutbacks. I heard I'm probably the next one because I know I was late two weeks ago and he didn't seem too happy about it. And I, I, I passed him on the street and he didn't wave. And so and all these things start going on. And nothing ever happened. He just was busy and just didn't have time to say hi or maybe didn't see you. But... The devil starts to play tricks on your mind. He starts to really distort things and the way people say things and look at things. And you can get yourself all worked up and someone can just really not say it properly. And you think, well, what's wrong with them? And they're mad at me. And, they and it's just all of a sudden that we've been talking about that battleground right here that we all deal with. Every single one of us. The enemy attacks us right here. That even when we're talking and we're telling people and they're asking us, how are you doing? Everything great. And the words coming out of our mouth, oh, I'm blessed. We're doing good. Family's good. Kids are good. Yeah, we're just, everything's good. And in your mind, you're going, my marriage is falling apart. I'm behind on the bills. I don't know what we're going to do. I, I mean, you, you know, I haven't felt good. You, you all, I mean, you know what I'm talking about? You, you, you're saying it, but in your mind, you know, if they could read your mind, we'd be in trouble. Right? We would be in real trouble. Why? Because the enemy chooses to battle us here. Here. That's even though when we're saying the right things and we're quoting scripture and we're doing everything that we know to do and we're in church and we're faithful and we've got a smile on our face and we're being nice. We're really being nice. We're trying. But in our mind, the devil's going, you're not fooling nobody. What are you doing? Everybody can see right through that. They know you had you know, all this stuff. Just so, you can't go. 
don't go that way. You've done it here. Have an altar call. It, it's amazing. Every single week. Bow your heads, close your eyes, raise your hand, going through this, blah, blah, blah. Woo, hands go up. 42 hands go up. All right, let's stand. Let's come to the altar. Three people come to the altar. Why? Because the devil's going, you go down there and everybody's going to know. They're going to know. I got news for you. Everybody is not going to know. Because everybody sitting around you is thinking everybody is going to know. <laughs> They're dealing with their own situation. You walking down there don't do nothing but relieve them. They're not even, I mean, they're so worried because the devil's attacking everybody. He don't want anybody to go down there. I've seen it happen all how many times. One comes down, then two, and usually in youth ministry and student ministry, I mean, the girls come in packs. I mean, you get one that leads, the whole row leads. Like, shh, they all come down, and one's going, they're just waiting for one to leave. And if they see one going, it's like, okay, good. I'm not throwing one. Blah, 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 all that. All go down. But every single week, this happens. Why? Because it starts right here. There's nobody out there saying, well, Pastor, I want to go. And I, you, know, you, don't vote, you don't vocalize it. It's going on right here in your head. When, when you're in tune with God and God's dealing with your heart and you're being honest and in your mind, it's going, I need help. I need help. Here's an opportunity for God to bless me. Bless me, but I don't want anybody to see me. I don't want anybody. And the devil starts to really attack you in that area. Starts to really beat you up right there and discourage you and distract you and bring up your past. Oh, you've been down. This is the third week in a row you've come down through. Let me just tell you something. As a pastor, it doesn't break my heart if everybody comes to the altar. It breaks my heart when nobody comes to the altar. Because I know you need to be in the altar. Just like I need to be in the altar. And I will tell you this tonight. Every single time the altars are open, you need to take advantage of it. Every single time, I don't care if their altar call is for an ingrown toenail that's been infected for three weeks. Who has one? And there's two people. I don't care what it's for. If there's an opportunity for you to come down in God's presence and have an opportunity to spend time alone speaking and praying to God and listening to God, you need to take advantage of it. Because there's some things that can take place down here in this altar that's not going to take place at your home. It's not going to take place at your in your car, driving down the road, at your workplace. Because you don't have, listen, we don't have, you don't have Jeff every day singing to you and ushering in the presence of God and creating that atmosphere and surrounded by godly people that are praying and seeking God. Because here's what happens. If the spirit is right and the attitude is right in church, the moment you step out of there and start walking down, Brother Ralph starts saying, oh, God bless them. Lord, whatever's taking place in their life, I pray that you anoint them, that you saturate them right now. Miss Laura looks up and says, oh, she's been on my heart for two weeks. Lord, whatever, listen, you do what needs to be done. And the saints of God and the family of God begins to pray and begins to intercede. And all of a sudden, one steps out and slips in behind this laser hand and just begins to pray. God, I've been there. You have done it for me. I've been in that place where I felt like there was no answer. There was no way out. But God, you did it for me. I know you can do it for them because your word is true. You're, you are faithful to what you promised. And no formed against us will prosper. They may be wounded, but God, they're not going to die. The devil can't take them out. You've promised to save them. And all of a sudden, if the spirit is right, if the attitude is right, when you step out, it's not going to look you there. And you know what? I'm not going to sit up here and tell you that there wouldn't be somebody that will say, ooh, I knew it. I knew it. I knew they were getting a divorce. I knew it. I saw it on Facebook. And I, I just read between lines. I just know. I mean, blah, blah, blah. You know what? They're going to say that. Listen, they've got more problems than you. You don't even worry about them. If they won't do that mess in the house of God, listen, you, there's nothing you can say or do to them that God ain't going to be able to do to them. All right? That, that attitude will not be honored and will not be blessed by God. God will not honor that. But God will honor someone who's obedient. God will honor someone who is humble and says, I need help. Listen, when altars are open, when there's an opportunity for you to worship, an opportunity for you to pray, you need to take it. You need to step out and say, listen, this is my time. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what they do. Because I, I, I think I know this church well enough. This church ain't going to do that. We got a bunch of people in this church that's walked through some things. 
That God has delivered them. And when someone they see someone in need and someone hurt, they're going to begin to pray for you. I can tell you right now, with the, without hesitation, that Monroe, if he sees somebody come down here and pray, he's going to be praying for them. If he knows that this, that his heart is not going to be, oh man, that, that's disappointing. That really hurts me. I really looked up to him. Let me tell you something. That, that needs to, you, you want to look up to him? You want, you want some, you better look up to him the fact that they're willing to get out of their seat and come to the altar. And come to the place that will make a difference. Get in a place because what they're saying is, you know what, I need help. I can't do it on my own. What would it profit me to gain everything? I got all the money, all this stuff, it doesn't matter. I need God in my life. And the devil starts to attack us right here. Right here. And I want to close with this. Oh, you are getting excited. Aren't you? James chapter 1. Verse 19. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. Slow to speak. Slow to become angry. Y'all need to highlight that. Write that down. Some of you need to quote that every day. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Ooh. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth. All of it. I looked it up in the Greek and all means everything. So. <laughs> all. Everything. Okay. Some of us have a hard time with that. We, we keep things back. Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. I've heard my dad say it a hundred thousand times. Good preaching and good teaching will not edify a prayerless soul. Prepare, accept, humbly accept the word that's being planted in you. That's been given you through worship time, through preaching, through Sunday school, through celebrate, through discipleship classes, all of that. Humbly accept the word. God, I receive it. I don't like it, but I receive it. It makes me uncomfortable, but I receive it. I don't know that I agree with it. It goes against everything I was raised on, but I receive it. Humbly receive the word that's planted in you, which can save you. Verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. But this is the verse we're going to quote on. We're going to end on. But do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Verse 22, do not deceive yourself. Don't just listen to the word. But the last part says, do what it says. I have the privilege and I have the honor of my stage in my life right now. I'm raising three crazy boys. Okay? I have three boys that are just, they're, they're all boy. All right? They don't act right all the time. And they don't listen all the time. And there are times, yeah, not the Harris boys, they never there are times when I've told them over and over again, and you've been here, parents, grandparents, you know what I'm talking about. And, and you tell them, and there comes a point where I'm sorry. I don't want to hear you're sorry. I want you to do what I told you to do. Do what I said. I don't want to hear I love you. I don't want to hear it never happened again. I don't want to hear all that stuff. I want you to do what I told you to do. I know you hear me. I know you, I know you understand. I know you, you can comprehend. You're smart enough. Do what I told you to do before I rip your little head off. You're killing me. There's a little there's a movie called The Sandlot. It's an older movie. The kids go, there's a little boy, you're killing me, Smalls. That's that's our that's our phrase in our house. You're killing me, Smalls. You're just killing me. You just over and over. You just, God, you're killing me. And there's those times where I know they hear me. Listen, I told them since they could understand. Flush the toilet. Put your trash in the trash can. That's why they call it a trash can. It's 
not a coincidence. It's on purpose. They meant to do that. So you could remember. Trash, trash can. It's a can. Trash goes in it. Can you tell I've had this conversation with my kids before? Put it. Hang your towel up. Carrie's been on the last, this last one. Towels everywhere. Go in their bathroom. Forty-two towels. Who have any towels? I, no, we don't have any towels. Y'all have plenty of towels. We have none. You got towels. They're just dirty. But there comes a point where it's like, I know you hear me. I, I know you understand. I don't give any excuses. Don't tell. Well, I, was, I, I, I don't care. Ty, put your shoes on. I don't. I don't care that your shirt's wrinkled. I, I, it doesn't matter to me that you got a... Put your shoes on. Put them on. Put them on. Well, I, I don't care. I told you to put your shoes on first. Do I have a witness here? I know I will. Frustrating. She's just like, are you kidding me? I mean, you, you hear me. Well, you know what I'm saying. You understand. Do what I told you to do. Just do it. Here's what I believe is the frustration in this scripture. That God's speaking through Paul saying, listen, here's, tell them, or James, listen, this is what needs to happen. Don't just listen to the word. Do what it says. Just, just do what it says. Don't, why don't, we don't need, listen, we don't need another Bible study. We don't need another revival. We don't need another seminar. We're so far educated above our obedience, it's pitiful. We got so much knowledge of who God is and what he is and what he can do in the Greek and blah, 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 blah. But we're so educated, we just can't do it. We just can't do what he says. When you back up here, the first part of it is simple. He says, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and accept the word of God. Get rid of everything that doesn't belong in your life. Everything that doesn't line up with the word of God. Everything that doesn't bring you closer to God. You don't need me there to tell you if it brings you closer to God or not. You know exactly what it is. The instruction is, get rid of it. Accept the word. Don't just listen to the word so that you deceive yourself. But do what it says. It's like a man looking in the mirror and walking away going, well, I don't remember what I look like. It's playing games. It comes all the way back up to here. Because we think in our mind we're getting away with something. We think up here we've got everybody fooled. We think up here, nobody knows. And you're right. We're right on that. There are times when we present a great front and we got it all. And nobody really, truly knows. Only God does. But as long as we're deceiving ourselves, we can't be obedient to God. And I got to imagine that God is up in heaven sometimes looking at my life, watching me when I asking him and praying to him Lord I need you and I could just see God going I will beat your head off you why don't you just do what I told you to do stop 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 telling me you do next month stop, stop, stop telling me don't, don't, don't give me I, just do what I told you to do do what I told you to do stop don't, don't just listen do it. I need you to do it. I can identify with that frustration with my three boys. Time is second. Please. For the love of all that's holy, just do it. Just do it this one time, please. Don't get to that. Don't talk. Just don't tell it. I'm so, I, don't, I don't care. I don't care that you're sorry. I know you're sorry. Just do it. Just do it. Hush. Do it. 
times are we guilty of that? It's up here we lose the battle. The devil begins to torment us, discourage us. It's over. And our Heavenly Father, we're praying and asking Him to help us if He's looking at us going, why don't you just do what I told you to do? Do what you can. Get that filth out of your house. You, you can't you can't ask God to deliver you from a pornography problem if you're still paying for the cable bill and for the internet bill and you've got all of it right there for you to watch. You have to be the one to cancel that. You, you, can't, you can't ask God to set you free from, from alcohol and from drugs and then keep a six-pack in the fridge just in case you need one to unwind. Just in case... Well, that's just, I, Pastor, I just have one with a meal. Of, but I, I, you know, I, to, I understand. I understand what's going on in your head. I understand how you've made it work. But I understand what takes place. You keep that door open. And then you have a bad day. And you get fired. And your wife walks out. And all of a sudden, it's not just one. It's a six-pack. And you, where you run out. I mean, I was with a guy the other day. And I was trying to help him. And he said, I quit drinking. I said, really? I quit today. I said, well, that's good. He said, I run out. I said, well, that's not quitting. That's not the same thing. That's in your mind. Well, I run out of beer today. I don't have any left. So I'm, I'm that's not, no, it's, it's, it's things in your life that you know that God has convicted you and he has put them, you got to get rid of it. Does that make sense? It's not just, it's in all ours, relationships and, and habits, addictions that we have in our life, things that we, that we think in our mind, oh, I have to have it. I gotta watch that. I talked to somebody last week that said a year ago, man just come through, they'd watched a certain soap opera for 15, 20 years. God convicted them, they stopped watching it. We can't watch soap operas. <laughs> Listen, you, everything, moral, filth. Things that keep you, draw you away from God. I've watched a few soap operas. We used, used to watch Days of Our Lives back in the day. Bo and Hope and Stefano and all those. They're still, I could watch it today and never missed one thing. It's taken them 20 years to, to carry out a little scene. It's, it's, it's where your prayer life comes in. Okay? That's where when you pray and God's speaking to you convicting you and you being obedient. And when he tells you to stop something, that's him. Don't just listen to it. And deceive yourself. Listen over and over. If people have been coming to church here for four years, they've listened to me preach for four years, and, and they're doing the same thing they were doing four years ago. Because they're just listening to it. They listen to the tapes, they listen to this preacher, they listen, 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 listen. And God just said, won't you just do what I've told you to do? Well, you know, I got this job. I, you know, my wife left me. And, you know, I had to, I, I owe this. And, you know, I had to take an extra job. Blah, blah, blah. God just said, well, won't you just do what I told you to do? Just do what it says. And if you and I tonight appear taking captive every thought Making it obedient. We talked last week about the weapons that we use. Purity and worship. And how in our purity and how in our thoughts. And trying to create a holy environment for our family to grow up in. For us to be in. Something that's free from sin. You know that's a big part of it. Trying to hear from God and we're listening and watching trash. It, it just doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Not for a 14 year old and not for someone who's 54. It just doesn't work that way. You, you have to create an environment to where God can speak and God can use you and God can, you can hear from God. It's part of it. And in our worship, we talked about last week when Paul and Silas are in prison. So your worship is important not just for you, but it's important for those around you. Because sometimes your praise will break their chains loose. Sometimes your actions and your obedience will give them the strength and the encouragement to come down. Sometimes, like what we talked about earlier, it takes that first one to come down and it's just like a chain reaction. 
You never know who's watching you worship and then all of a sudden I think, you know what? <sighs> They've been through a lot. If they can stand here and worship, I can too. That's exactly it. Just be blessed. Have you been blessed by watching somebody worship? Just, I mean, just like, man, I wish I could worship that way. Growing up, I knew when we were about to have church. I told you last week, I just knew. There's certain few people in the church, boy, whoo, they get that little war boot going. And they get to shaking. I mean, you just know. I mean, they were feeling it. That's one that we used to feel it. You know, you really feel it. It's just, they just, I mean, it was just, they get excited. And I knew something was about to break loose. And I knew Stanley Pittman at any moment was about to come running down that aisle, take off across the front. Boy, he'd make several laps around, and then he'd just do like a tornado. He'd just spin <laughs> all the way across the front. And he dropped to his knees and he bawled and cried. I mean, just people, I mean, you just knew. But I remember as a kid watching them worship, thinking, ooh, man, what is going on? What is that? What's going, what's taking place? And I'd see my dad get excited. He'd kick his leg up above his head. He'd get to shout. I mean, just, I just knew. I knew when it, wow, they're worshiping. I can always have those times when you come in, you sit in church, and you just, oh, everybody's kind of down, and all of a sudden somebody begins to worship. And all of a sudden, there's just a, just a presence that fills the room. And all of a sudden, you realize that none of your praise has made anything happen. But all of a sudden, somebody else is getting a hold of God. Somebody else is ushering in the presence of God. Somebody else is getting their praise on, and God likes it. Someone else is lifting up his name and beginning to honor him and, and, and begin to worship him the way he deserves to be worshipped. And all of a sudden, there's just a presence that sits in the room. And all of a sudden, there's something inside of you that starts to think, you know what, I can get, I, I can do this. I, I can make it. I, you know, it's not the end of the world. I've had a bad day. I've had a bad week. I've had a bad year. But you know what, I can make it. There's a room full of people here that can do it. If they can stand up and shout and worship, I know them. They've been divorced three times. They've been bankrupt twice. And I know they they lost their son last year. But if they can stand up and praise, listen, my situation not near as bad as theirs. If they can praise, I can praise. And all of a sudden, their praise begins to break their chains. And then your chains begin to break. And all of a sudden, God begins to move. And God begins to speak to you again. And for one split second, what the enemy was saying, you can't do it. You're not good enough. You're never going to make it. What are you doing in church? This is the last place you ought to be. All of a sudden, God begins to say, listen, you're going to be all right. You're going to make it. Remember, I promised you that I'd never leave you nor forsake you. Listen, my promises are yea and amen. And I'm a man that I would not lie and I cannot lie. All of a sudden, that praise begins to change everything. And in our mind, we start to think, I can do this, I can do this, I can make it. I'm going to make it. And their praise, your praise can make the difference in somebody else's life. Your praise and the way you live your life will make a difference. My parents, their life, their holiness, their standards they have in their life today has made a difference in my life. It's shaped and it's formed the man I am, the father I am, the, the husband I am. Because I watch them live it every single day. Because they put God first and there was holiness in our household. There were certain things that were not allowed in our house. There were certain things that we didn't compromise on. And my friends and other people, listen, there's a reason why I, I didn't step foot in a movie theater until I was 16, almost 17 years old. Because my parents said, we're not going to go there. They, they restricted that. There were certain things that they wanted. We wasn't one of these crazy, off the wall, you know, or things, rainbow and butterfly stuff. But there were just certain things that we didn't do. And I'm thankful for that. Listen, when I was growing up, I wasn't thankful for it. When I was 11 and couldn't understand why I couldn't see Ernest Saves Christmas, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Holiness was not on the menu. Alright? I didn't, I didn't get it. But my parents took a stand. So listen, there are certain things we're not, we don't want to open up and choose to put into our life. I'm thankful for that now. It shaped me as a man. It shaped me as a husband, as a father. The decision I make today because I saw my parents stand for holiness to try to create an environment of purity. They weren't perfect by no means, but they were trying. They were trying to create that atmosphere. And I watched my parents praise God and worship God through the biggest tragedies of our life. And their worship spurred me on. 
Your worship will get you through. It just might break somebody else's chains as well. And it all starts right here. Don't be deceived. Don't just listen to it. Don't just hear the words of God and the promises of God, but actually obey and do. 